Thank you. You may have a seat. You know, as we think about uh, this, this whole week, it's called Passion Week, you know, the last week of Christ's life, and we think about Good Friday, the, this coming Friday when Jesus was crucified on the cross, and, 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 and we'll be thinking all week, you know, can't wait till next Sunday, we celebrate the resurrection, and, and I was just, as we were singing that last song, I was just thinking, you know, nobody forced Christ into the position that he was in to die. There, there was no, nothing, nothing happened that surprised the Lord and, and he, that he found himself in the midst of this situation in Jerusalem in that last week where he ended up dying. It was nothing like that. Everything about Jesus was for that one thing. It was to dine. It was to, it was to pay the price for our sin. And today, as most of you probably know, your church people, that today's Palm Sunday. And then tomorrow's something else. And then Tuesday, then Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday. Even Saturday has a name. Did you know that? Do you know what Saturday's called? They call it Black, Sun, Black Saturday. I, I read it yesterday. They got multiple names. <laughs> but, and then, then I thought, then I read again, and one person might have a negative name for a day, another person might have a positive name for the day, like Maundy Thursday and different things like that. But I don't want to get into any of that. I just want to look, about, look at this week and what Jesus' real desire was. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the Passion Week. And, and our text this morning is Luke chapter 18, verse 31, all the way to Luke chapter 23. Joe goes, what? <laughs> it's like four and a half chapters there. So we're not going to read the text to begin with. We're going to walk through and the reason I want to do this is because when we, when we go through this week, it would be wonderful if we think about Jesus as he walks through the week. Today, he, he would have come into the city triumphantly. And, but before we get into all that, and before we you know, look at this whole week, why do they call it Passion Week? And there's probably two reasons why they call it Passion Week. The word passion comes from the Latin word meaning to endure or suffer. So this is the week that Christ is preparing, that he is coming to that place where he will endure the wrath of his Father for the sin of man, where he will endure the suffering of, of those who mocked him and ridiculed him and cried out, crucify him, and put the crown of thorns on him. And as he was in some of the interrogations and he was be, he, he was beaten you know he endured he suffered all those things so to think about the passion of Christ like Stephen said it is to think about the suffering of Jesus the crucifixion of Christ is the high point of not only this week but really the high point of human history because the crucifixion of Christ is the pinnacle of the salvation of man. There is no other God, no other religion, no other thing or philosophy that says, you don't deserve it. You can't do anything to earn it. I have done it all for you. Surrender to me. And I will forgive you and allow you to live in my kingdom for eternity. There's nothing else like this truth, like Christ. But it is also called the Passion Week because of the passion with which Jesus willingly went to that cross. Willingly went to the cross to pay for our sins. Think about it. Willingly knew that he would endure the pain and the agony of the sin of mankind. God's wrath of sin on him. It's called the Passion Week because 
He was not tricked in, in, into it. He did not slip into the cross. He did not he did not stumble into the cross. It wasn't because finally the religious leaders of the Jewish nation finally found a way to get rid of him. It wasn't anything like that. It was always what he purposed to do. For three, three and a half years, he would often tell his disciples privately, listen, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to die. I'm going to go into that city, I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise again. But they just couldn't contemplate it. So again, for the final time, Jesus is on the brink of going into the city, and he takes the 12, in Luke 18, and he takes the 12, and he says to them, look, see, we are now going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spent upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him and on the third day he will rise. But they did not understand any of these things because the saying was hidden from them. They didn't grasp what Jesus said. Let's pray. Lord, as we open this week, I pray that you would open our minds. I pray that we would see what is behind all of this. And I ask you, Lord, to be with us and to help us. May we sense your presence and may the truth batter our hardened hearts and penetrate us and do a work in us and draw us, either as Christians or lost. Draw us to you. In Christ's name, amen. And right after Jesus said, see, let's go up into the city, that's exactly what he did. The Bible tells us that, that he rode a donkey into the city of Jerusalem. And as he rode, it was an amazing sight. People gathered along the, the streets and the, and the byways there, and they would throw out palm branches, and they took their coats, the disciples did, and laid it on this donkey, and, and they, they laid things out in front of him as, as he went into the city. And the Bible tells us as they spread their coats on the road, he was, and as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples, they began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen him do. And this is what they said. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees, as they saw this and they were watching and they said to and they, and they were in the crown, they said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples for saying, Hosanna, the king is coming. Don't let them do that. And Jesus answered, Listen, I, I tell you this. If they were silent, the very stones would cry out the same thing. What an amazing picture. This is what they'd been waiting for. You know, the prophecies had been written and they'd been waiting for decades and hundreds of years and hundreds and hundreds of years and just a multiplied amount of time. And finally, the king is coming. And they were welcoming the true king. And they were praising God and shouting Hosanna and laying down the palm branches. And all of that, it fulfilled the scriptures. It was truth and it was being un unveiled before their eyes. Such joy was in the streets. The Messiah had come. The King is here. And you know what? We could take a look at that and we could look at how it fulfilled prophecy and to the very day and all of those things. But as I was reading this account of this week, there was a theme and a line that struck me throughout all of these things. So here's what I want you to see. You see, before Jesus rode the donkey into the city, before they shouted out the praise, before they laid out the branches, before all of that happened, He looks at his disciples 
And listen to what he said. He called two of his disciples to him. And he said, go into the village in front of you. Where on entering you will find a colt tied. On which no man has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying the colt? Simply say to them, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away, they did what Jesus said, and they found it just as he had told them. And those two disciples, they went and they got the colt, the donkey, and they brought it to Jesus and they prepared it and they put their coats and cloaks and different things on it. And he rode that donkey into the city. And and if he had walked into the city, it would have probably been a different story. Because he'd walked into the city many, many times. But see, the king rides into the city. And the king of peace will ride a colt into the city. You see, Jesus didn't come to overthrow the, the, the Roman government. He didn't come to crush them in that way as a political king. That's why he didn't ride a stallion. He didn't come to make war. He came to bring peace. And that, that riding of a colt was symbolic of bringing peace into the city as a king. Jesus put into play the road to the cross. He initiated. Can I say this? He antagonized it. He stirred it up. It wasn't something that, again, we think that, oh, poor Jesus, you know, they caught him at a bad time. No, they didn't. Before Jesus even went into the city, he purposed to do it boldly. For three and a half years as he taught, what was a recurring theme to his disciples and different people? He would do something. He would heal somebody. Heal the eyes. Heal the body. And then he said, look, 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 look. Go to the temple, give an offering, but don't tell nobody. Keep it quiet to yourself. He often told his disciples, Shh, th- this is just for you guys. Hang on to it on your own. Because it wasn't time. It wasn't time for the leaders to be stirred to that moment of pure hatred and evil to kill the Son of God. See, Jesus put into play the road to the cross. He purposed to do this all those years of ministry. Remember, he told them, shh. But yet now, see, by sitting on that colt, he was announcing, hey, the king is coming. The king is here. That's what he was saying. And that's what those people were shouting. Though, they thought he was coming to be the triumphant king over the Romans. But really what he was doing is becoming the triumphant king over sin and death. You see, as Jesus drew near to the city, do you know what he did? He cried. The Bible says that as Jesus wept, He wept and he said, would you, would that you even had known on this day the things that would make for peace? Would you have understood? He is crying because he didn't understand that what he was about to do, coming into the city as king, what he would do in the temple, what he would do through the teaching of the parables, what he would do on that night that he gave, instituted the sorrow, all these things. And then when he died on the cross, what he would do to bring peace to the soul of man. That's why Jesus came. You know, Palm Sunday, yes, it's about fulfillment of Scripture. Yes, it's about the praise and the joy. Yes, do you know what it's really about? It's about Jesus purposing to do what he came to do for you and I. They wanted a national king, a political savior. But Jesus came to save them from our sins. He was not forced. Do you get it? He didn't find himself in a bad situation. Let's face it. It was of his own purposeful doing. Jesus 
said, it's time. And as he went into the city, the Bible goes on to say, and that pretty much ended that first day, and that completes the triumphal entry of Palm Sunday. Now we go into Monday morning, and Jesus as king, what does he do? Let's read it. Luke 11, or I'm sorry, Mark 11, verse 15. That morning, he entered the temple, temple, and he began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and he was saying to them, Is it not written? My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes, they heard it, and they, they were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. He comes in as a triumphant king, and his first act, as that king, as he goes into the temple. Do you know why he went into the temple? He went into the temple because the religious leaders had corrupted the worship of the people. They had turned it all upside down. They made it about themselves. They made it about money. They made it about, about power or prestige. They did not make it about God. And you, we think of our modern day today, how much of church is not about God? It's about style, it's about, it's about the music, or it's about the way the pastor presents himself, or it's about the people in the church leaving just feeling good, or, or all of a multitude and myriad of different things. But the king came into his temple, and he kicked over tables, and he kicked out the money changers and he kicked out see there were people using that courtyard of the gentiles as a thoroughfare as a shortcut to the other side of the city can you imagine people coming in here today to try to get from annandale road to the high street there's they come in come in that front door and go around down the lower hall come in the auditorium and out the back door and down the the the, the we would be appalled, would we not? We would probably want to fight a little bit. What are you doing? But that's what they were doing in the temple. You see, the court of the Gentiles was a special place. Do you know what it was about? See, the Jewish religion, you know, was very kind of Jewish only, right? No. See, that court of the Gentiles was where the nations, the people of the nations would come to be able to worship God. But they corrupted it. They made it a place not for worship, but for money and selling and, 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 and doing what they wanted to do. They corrupted it and they pushed away people to come and hear about the true and living God. And you know, we come to this Monday, when we think about Monday, we think about Jesus saying, this false, messed up, corrupted place went from being a place where I could be worshipped, my father could be worshipped, but now you've destroyed it. That's what I think about. Do you know what? If Jesus never did that, he would not have aroused the religious leaders to murder him. But that simple act of coming in as triumphant king and cleansing out and saying, you have corrupted real worship. So Jesus stirred up the religious leaders. He showed them that this act of doing this testified about God's holiness, and they forgot about it. He condemned them for their false worship. It showed that Jesus was on a mission as the Son of God, and he had a greater authority over the temple than even the high priest. In a sense, I thought about this. Jesus says, this is my place, but you've destroyed it. 
That was his announcement. He showed them that their worship had become corrupt and profane, and it had nothing to do with God. And in verse 18, the chief priests and the scribes heard all of this, and they began to seek a way to destroy him, for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And you know what he did after he cleared out that place? kicked them out, turned over the table, stopped them from coming in. The Bible says that he sat down and the people began to come to him and be healed. The people sat down and they listened to him as he taught with power and grace. You know what he did? He said, this is what this place is supposed to be like. It's to be a place of worship, to be a place of truth. It's to be a place of healing. It's, a be, it's to be a place of truth. That's what Jesus did on that second day of the week. The first day, he prepared us for a king. The second day, he prepared us for true, real worship. And then on Tuesday. Tuesday, he began to go through a bunch of parables with his disciples. Too much to read, so let me just share with you what he did. See, I, I was thinking about it as I was reading all these parables and as the Lord was teaching his disciples and the people. I don't know about you, but when I have something heavy on my heart and on my mind, something that's difficult, something that would bring me hurt or shame or agony, I, I don't know about you, but I tend to retreat. I tend to be quiet. I separate myself from people. What, anybody like that here? When the weight is so heavy, don't, don't talk to me. Lisa knows. She's downstairs in crush this morning. But Lisa knows. If I'm not talking, she says to me, what's wrong? Something heavy on you? Anything happened? She knows how I am. But you know what Jesus did? He's, he knows what's coming. He knows the agony. He knows the, the pain of the suffering of his father's wrath over sin that would be placed upon him. He, he knew the mockery and all of that. What does he do? He draws himself to his disciples to prepare them for what is to come. To prepare them for what's to come after. And not only did he prepare them, but he gave us teaching to prepare us as we walk this road, waiting for his return. See, when I have something heavy, I retreat. I go within myself. I become quiet and distant, as many do. And we become less aware of the needs of those around us, but not Jesus. In chapters 20 and 21, Jesus taught them that this temple that they are right in the midst of would be destroyed. But that he, as the chief cornerstone, would build something new called a church and that the religious leaders would kill the son of the king and all of this would be handed over to others who would allow the Gentiles to come in freely. The Jewish system was being set aside because the religious leaders were rejecting him and all of this would be done and the church would be born. That's what he taught them. He taught them how to live in this world. He told them, hey, you know what? You're going to live in this world but not be of this world. You're, you're going to be of a different world, the kingdom of God. And, and so what you do is you'll render to Caesars the things that belong to Caesars. But the things that belong to God, they don't belong to Caesar and should only be given to God. And he taught them that you live... There's things that he will get, but what belongs to God, you give to God. You live your life for God. He taught them about the resurrection life. He taught them that the resurrection life in that kingdom would be different than the life in this world. That those who through, through repentance and faith would, would enter God's kingdom. And you wouldn't be given to marriage. You wouldn't be having children. It would be a different kind of kingdom there would be no need for that everything else would be satisfied 
He taught them that the Messiah was more than just David's son. That he would be more than just one who would sit on the throne in Jerusalem. He was actually David's Lord. He was God. And he taught them about the nature of the Messiah and what he would do. He taught them to beware of hypocritical teachers who falsely teach things in the name of God but do it for monetary gain and for power and they're hypocrites and they do not actually live out what they teach. This is what he did as he sat there on a Tuesday and he began to teach his disciples the parables about the vineyard and about the tenants and about the fig tree. All of that was this. You would think that someone who was getting ready to suffer such agony wouldn't be concerned about his people. But that's exactly what was on his mind. He taught them how to be rich toward God by talking about a widow who gave everything she had. Not to be anxious about this life, but to seek God's kingdom and be willing to sell all that they have and leave everything behind. Why? Not to earn anything, not to gain anything, not to buy forgiveness or salvation, but because of a love from God and for God. You should read these parables sometimes and see what Jesus taught us. He taught them what to look for. He prepared them for their last days. He prepared them for his coming and his return. He would tell them what would happen before he came back to set up his kingdom. Why? Because he wanted them to be ready. He wanted them to live with purpose in this life. And he told them to be spiritually ready. And he said, watch out. Listen to what he told them. He said, watch out and don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. Don't let that day catch you unaware like a trap. For that day will come upon everyone living on the earth. Keep alert at all times and pray that you will escape the coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. He prepared them. In this Passion Week, his mind, yes, was on the cross, but his heart was on us. Do you see the line? Go get the donkey. It's time to tell him the king is here. He cleared out the temple saying, look, this is not real worship. And he showed us the way for true worship. He sat down with the disciples, and mind you, the disciples, some of whom would deny him, Peter. And you know, as they, were, as they were walking to the garden, after they had the supper, after Jesus washed their feet, do you know what those lovely disciples was going to do? They were going to argue over who is the greatest. Often our minds are like that, thinking of ourselves, but not the Christ. That whole week was about us. You say, what, but what about Wednesday? He really didn't do a whole lot on Wednesday. I mean, that was just the day that Jesus went to the priests and those religious leaders and just kind of, you know, made the agreement for his betrayal. I want to show you something. In Luke 22, it says, Now, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread drew near, and it's called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was one of the number of the twelve. And Judas went away, and he conferred with the chief priests and the officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad, and they agreed to give him money. 30 pieces of silver. And so he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the crowd. Then you say, you know what? That's what it was. 
It wasn't that Jesus didn't get crucified because he rode a donkey and said he's king. He didn't get crucified because, you know, he, 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 he cleared out the temple. He did that at the beginning of his ministry, and they didn't kill him then. It, it wasn't that. They didn't kill him because he taught all these wonderful things, and he, he taught with power, and he astonished the people, and, and, the, and the religious leaders were kind of like, you know, who does he think he is? That's not, he died, he got killed because Judas betrayed him. But you know, even in that, Jesus was the driving force behind it? Let, let me show you. You see, every step of the way this week, Jesus Christ was in control. He was purposeful. He was mindful. He knew exactly what he was doing, why he was doing it. And even in the consenting of betrayal, in the actual betrayal itself, Jesus was in control. You see, the plan for betrayal was not a surprise to the Lord. It was his plan. You know, if you read in the book of Zechariah, it actually tells us Zechariah prophesies about the Messiah being betrayed. He prophesies how that betrayer would be paid 30 pieces of silver. It was already in the books. Do you know why? Because God planned it from the very beginning that the Christ would be betrayed. He purposed it. You know what the Bible says in the Gospels about it? In John 6, verse 64, Jesus is speaking to the disciples. I think he's it, you know, in that upper room and he's doing, the, he's doing that last evening with them. And he says, listen, there are some of you who do not believe. And then, and then there's a parenthesis and it explains what that means. And it says, for Jesus knew from the beginning. It wasn't like the disciples and Jesus was rocking down the road and, and, and all of a sudden this dude named Judas came up and said, look, I'm good financially. I know how to do the books. You know, I've got an accountant's degree and all of this. And, you know, I, I see, you know, God's really blessing your ministry, uh, Jesus. And you're going to need someone to watch the purse and take care of the finances. And you kind of need me. And Jesus goes, oh, yeah, you'd be a great asset. And so he hires him. No, Jesus saw him and knew even before he showed up. He knew from the very beginning that Judas would betray him. And he said, come. Doesn't that blow your mind? Doesn't that just make you realize that this week of passion in the cross and what's to come? It wasn't just a really good story. It was the very heart of God and what he determined needed to be done for us. He knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and, it, and who it was who would betray him. You see, when it came time for Judas to actually do it, to actually betray him, Jesus looks at him and I, they're eating together and he says this, what you are going to do, go do it quickly. There's no, there's no, whoops, oh, this is happening in the mind of Christ. It was the very purpose of God. And, and you know, when we're going through this week and we think of these days, all I can really think and all that really comes to my mind is the love of God for us. The love that he poured out and shed, the love that Christ has for us, that, that he would do all these things purposefully day by day why because we needed saving and that day of making an agreement with the religious leaders it passed and now we're into Thursday and there is so much in the narrative of the night that Jesus was arrested taking the Passover meal with his disciples. 
instituting the Lord's Supper, washing their feet. Jesus telling Peter of his denial, and yet Peter saying, No, Lord, no, I'll die for you, but I will never deny you. And then a few hours later, the crow sounded. The rooster sounded. The dispute between the disciples of who's the greatest one. The Lord's agony in the garden and the disciples' spiritual lethargy. I mean, Christ is, is in agony because he knows what he is going to do. He knows what needs to be done. He prays, Father, let this cup pass, but if not, let your will be done. And he comes a couple of different times as he's praying and he's, the Bible says it was as if he was sweating droplets of blood. The, the agony was so intense and deep. What does he find when he comes back? To his disciples, they're asleep. There was just lethargy there, just nothing. The ambush of Christ, the kiss of betrayal, the cutting off of the high priest's ear, all of it. And we could have taken several weeks to just preach through all of those different things. But you know what? As I thought about that day, and it's wonderful to have the Lord's Supper and we think about the death and the sacrifice of Jesus and all the wonderful things he taught there, but there's one thing that stands out during this entire evening from the time he broke bread with them to the time of Peter taking his sword and chopping the high priest's servant's ear off. When he did that, when Peter did that, Christ looked around, and here's what he said. Do you not think that I could appeal to my Father and that he would at once send more than 12 legions of angels? Do you know what he's saying? Jesus is saying, listen, you guys don't Get it. I'm not falling into a trap and being crucified. I'm not being forced to go to the cross. I have told you before over and over again that I need to go to Jerusalem and die and rise again just as the prophet said. I could have called 12,000 angels down and stopped it in a breath but that's not what I'm going to do. Because that's what's not, because that is not what needs to be done. Do you see, beloved? If you are a child of God, you've got to understand that this entire week, yes, his mind was on the cross, but his heart was on us. And somewhere that evening, Thursday night, it drifts into Friday morning. And they say that somewhere between 10 p.m. and 4 p.m., Jesus was arrested. He was taken to the high priest and some religious leaders. And it was there that he was mocked and beaten they spat upon him. They hated him. But he sat there. Or he stood there. Or he lay there. Or however he was. They, they, they just took it out on him. But he didn't answer any of the charges against him. They blindfolded him. They blindfolded him and said, Ha! Ha! ha prophesy, you prophet! Who is striking you? And they blasphemed the Son of God. And they brought him from there before the council. And they asked him, are you the Christ? And Jesus simply said, if I tell you, you wouldn't believe. Oh my goodness, isn't that a yes answer right there? It's like he's rocking up and saying, well, of course I am. But he said, this is what he said. 
But here's what I tell you. From here on, the Son of Man, Jesus says me, him, shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. Equality. Amen? That just fumed them to no end. He goes, they say, are you the Son of God? You say that I am. And from there, they brought him before Pilate because the hate and the evil was so built up in him. They needed that approval from him to crucify him. So they took him before Pilate. And Pilate simply says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, yeah, you said so. And Pilate goes, oh, you're from Galilee. Hey, go see Herod. And they send him off to Herod. And I don't know about you, and I don't really like to talk bad about people, but I think he was a Cretan. Herod was a bad man. He was an arrogant person. And, and he said, man, I'm glad that Jesus come because I wanted to see some miracles. But Jesus didn't say a word. He didn't speak before Herod. He gave no answer. And they treated him with contempt. I can't even bring my mind to understand or fathom how they could do that to the Son of God. But Herod said, since he won't answer back, they beat him, they put a robe again on him, they beat him, they mocked him, they spat upon him, they brutalized him, and they sent him back to Pilate. And Pilate, exasperated, he goes, I'll tell you what, Religious leaders, how about, you know, it's in the law. How about I release a person to you? And I've got this Barabbas guy in Jesus. And he figured G they would take Jesus because Barabbas was an insurrectionist and he was a murderer. But you know what they got, did? They began to cry out, crucify him, crucify him. Not Barabbas, but Jesus. Put him on that Roman instrument of death. Kill him, murder him. We don't want him. Crucify him. And Pilate, exasperated, washed his hands. And he handed him over to be crucified. There was not a time that Jesus argued his innocence. Not one time in all of that did Jesus argue for his release. He had a purpose in which he needed to do. And on that way to the place of crucifixion, he is followed by a multitude of people crying and mourning for Jesus. And you know what? We, we, as we study, we don't know if those people who were, those ladies, women who were crying after Jesus, we don't know if they were sincere or if they were those people who were hired for funerals and things and they were paid to mourn and to cry out. We, we don't know either one. You ask John MacArthur, he thinks they were paid. You ask... Um, uh, Bible knowledge commentary, I forget who wrote that one, Joe, but you, BKC, you ask them and they say it was sincere mourners. It doesn't make a difference because here's the point. They're crying, they're following after Jesus, they're making a big scene. Jesus stops and he turns around to them and he says, daughters of Jerusalem, do not cry for me. Do not cry for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. Weep, for you do not understand what is being done. You do not understand what is to come. And I believe he was saying, you do not realize the judgment that is coming upon you. Not just nationally, but individually for, the, for rejecting the Son of God. And they brought him to Golgotha. They brought him to the place of the skull, to the place of crucifixion, and they put him between two criminals. Follow the pattern. He never once argued for his freedom. He told them, you need to mourn for yourself. You need to repent. You need to cry. Don't cry for me. I'm good. And then he's put between two criminals. And those thieves, those robbers, those criminals began to Again, mock him and ridicule him and 
probably curse and all the other things that, that you would do. And, and they did that to Jesus. And you know what Jesus did? This is the place and the time in which Jesus cries out, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they do. Doesn't that just blow your thinking? Anybody else like those thieves, Dan? They were cursing and crying and probably cursing the the politicians and the crowd. And it just, hey. But Jesus, crucified, says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And later on, as the couple of hours wear by, one of those thieves, they, he, he comes to his right mind. He realizes that he's on that cross due to his own sin, his own crimes. And he looks to Jesus and he says to Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Christ looks at that thief and he says, Today, You will be with me in paradise. And for three more hours, Jesus suffered. The darkness engulfed them. The wrath of God came upon Christ. The temple, uh, the, the, the veil in the temple was torn in two. The sacrificial lamb of God has been sacrificed for sinners. And, And Jesus has paid the price and he's taken the wrath of God. And then he does one last thing. The Bible says in Luke 23, 40, the, the Bible says in Luke 23, 46, calling out with a loud voice, Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. L- listen, do you get it? Do you see the power in it? Do, or do we miss it? I think oftentimes we miss it. We think that the religious leaders finally figured out how to conspire against Christ and crucify him and get rid of him. But it wasn't like that at all. This entire week shows us one thing, that this is what Jesus wanted to do. He got the cult. He roused up the religious leaders by clearing out the temple. He taught his disciples, I'm going to prepare you to live without me. For what's to come. He knew and chose and planned his betrayal. He could have called down 12,000 of the most powerful beings this universe would have ever seen. And before they could even be seen, probably all of them would have been wiped out. But he didn't. He didn't argue one thing against all the accusations. Are you the Christ? You say that I am. Are you the king? You say that I am. I am going to be sitting at the right hand of power with God after this. He's crucified on that cross. And people say, oh, oh, look what's happening to Jesus. And Jesus says, no, don't cry for me. Cry for yourself. Father, forgive them. You will be with me in paradise today. Do you understand what's happening here? He was always thinking about the mission and why he came and for whom he came for us. He gave his life. And what marks this last week of Jesus' life is his willingness, his desire, his purpose, his intent, and his mission to pay for the sins of man. And what we need to do is just need to be an awesome worship of Christ because of what he's done for us. Amen? And I was thinking, in closing, I was thinking, what application do I make? I have none. But here is one thing that I think is the great application. For God so loved 
the world that he gave his only son, me, and that son willingly gave himself. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Hey, it's about Jesus, amen? It's all, yeah, give him, a, it's about him. Listen, listen, as we go through this week, take some time this week, read his passion, read Luke 19 through 23. Tomorrow morning, think about him making the way for true worship. Think about him in his word, teaching us how to live and be prepared for his coming. Think about him when he takes that Passover meal and that third cup of wine. He passes it to, the, to his disciples in the Passover supper and he says, drink this cup. This cup is my blood. For the, for, for the remission of sins. Do you know what that third cup was? That was the cup of redemption. He's the redeemer. Think about that on, on Thursday. And on Friday, don't think of it as Black Friday. Think of it as Good Friday. Our good, good Father sent his good good, perfect son who never fought it but willingly gave his life for you and I. Let's pray. Lord, I pray these my words. Jesus, I'm unworthy. I probably would have been the thief that did not repent and cursed you. I probably could have been with that crowd that said, crucify him, crucify him. But Lord Jesus, I am so thankful. More than we can put into words, I am thankful that, that I was able to hear what you've done for us. That I was able to see that you are the Son of God, the Savior. And I... And that you spoke in my heart and you showed me that I'm sinful and you showed me that you are holy and you showed me that you paid for my sin. And Lord, you said, if anyone believes on me, shall be saved. Lord Jesus, I'm thankful for that. I pray this week that we as a church and anybody in this room, if they're Christian or not Christian, they would think upon these things. Lord, that these truths, these things that you did, the things that you purposed to do, the things that you endured, Lord, that it would open our understanding and we would fall before you in humble submission that you are Christ. Lord, thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.